Hello everyone, it's Sunday evening at 6 o'clock time for our Sunday evening 6 p.m. podcast and Facebook uh, Family Fellowship Chapel Facebook Bible Study. Tonight we're back in session 3 of the Divine Path to Tilt the Floor that will allow us to win the lost. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Open our eyes that we can see in our ears, that we can hear in our heart, that we can understand what the Word of God says to us and then may... We apply that to our hearts and lives so that we can be changed into the image of your dear Son. Now, Father, we ask that Jesus would speak to us through the Holy Ghost. Let us know exactly what we need to know, do, understand, and demonstrate. We'll receive it and release it to your people. From there, we will come into correction and build a foundation that is sure and settled on the voice and words of Jesus Christ. We give you praise and honor and glory for all of it in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, our Lord, and our man in the Godhead. Amen. I want to say welcome to everybody from wherever you're listening, internationally or around the United States. Contact us at springston56 at gmail.com, mikespringstonministries.com, ffcma.org, or through Family Fellowship Chapels, direct messaging. Whatever avenue you do and whatever it is that you need to share with us or ask us about, Uh, we will be certain to give you our very best response. So tonight we're looking into part three, and we left off session two with Paul Paul, speaking in Philippians chapter three, beginning with verse 13. We're going to start this with focusing on verse 16, but let's read. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press... Toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if any in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So today, let's begin with verse 16. In verse 16, he says we have attained or we have in fact arrived somewhere. Now he says, let us walk or move forward based upon the same rule. This means based upon the same standard. Now, who is the standard here? What is the rule here? It's Jesus Christ who has given us a high calling of God for us to be able to move towards and then into. Uh, He says, be of the same mind. That mind of whom? Both Paul and Christ. Now he says, follow me. That's his verse 17. Go where I go, teach what I teach, and what you will acquire in so doing will be a prize that will place you in a higher calling. And that higher calling will always be found in Christ Jesus. Now, what was that blessing of which his father had provided for Jesus Christ? What was that endowment that was provided for the apostles? What was the ministry that came to Paul for the removing of blindness and the power to receive the revelation of the ministry to the Gentiles? Well, the world doesn't want to hear this, but it was the infilling of the Holy Spirit that allowed the Holy Spirit to speak words of instruction, direction, guidance, And to put words in their mouth, whether it was John the Baptist, whether it was Jesus, whether it was the apostles, whether it was Paul, that gave them the message that was required to meet, not only to meet and match, but to overcome the world. Think about that. Now, isn't that interesting? Jesus needed the Holy Spirit in a tangible means to be a force in his ministry. God provided him to Jesus, as we see in the Gospels. The apostles needed the Holy Spirit in a tangible way to fulfill the things that Jesus defined for their ministry, predominantly to the Jews. So what did he give them? The Holy Spirit. Paul, 
the one called to be the missionary evangelist to a godless society, was also provided with the infilling of the Spirit in order to accomplish his call. My friend, never has a ministry been undertaken by a man in the earth who has genuinely been put on mission under the plan of God, that it was not accompanied by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When the ministry is done in the way that Jesus began to do it and to teach it. Now, many are going to say right now, well, no, wait a minute, Pastor. One of the greatest evangelists in the world, Billy Graham, he was not of a Pentecostal persuasion, and I know that. And the outcome was that Billy Graham ministered to a lot of people, led a lot of people to Christ, and the knock on Billy Graham and his ministry was there was no follow-up. There was no way to follow up on what Billy Graham did. So we have a generation of people who were led to Christ and never understood that there was more to the salvation plan than just being saved. You say, Pastor Mike, how do you know that? Well, my friend, I don't have to look very far to see what the outcome of that uh, general ministry has been. Our world is in chaos. There has to be a reason that our world is in chaos when on every corner is a church. When the gospel has gone and the book of Revelations tells us that it's gone by satellite, it is in every home by means of a television. It is on the airwaves all over everything, but yet the chaos persists. And the chaos is getting worse and worse and worse. Someone said, yeah, but that's just the concept of the end time. It is, in fact. It is also the concept of a ministry that caused Jesus to look into the eyes of people and say, I, I, I never knew you. So many will identify that there have been ministries and organizations that have operated absent of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to be absolutely correct in that. But there are many who have built their foundation on the concept. Now watch what I'm about to share with you here of something called the Great Commission. Well, that phrase doesn't appear in Scripture as such. But we hear it all the time. History tells us that it was first used in the 17th century and it became popular, popular from a missionary named Hudson Taylor who was doing missionary work and, as I recall the story, was asking for financial help in his mission work. And so this term, the Great Commission, became the mantra of the intellect. It became the mantra of man. It became the doctrine of man. It played off of what Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 28. But it did not fulfill, cannot fulfill, and never will fulfill the actual teachings of Jesus Christ. Huh. So we have stated where we are uh, isn't necessarily based upon what the Scriptures have declared and what the Scripture has shown us that, well, that, uh, of the place where we should be. Where we are has been defined by the mind of the human intellect. How do we get here? Well, in reality, it's by the same means, now watch it now, by the same means that the world has gone in the direction that it appears that it has. There was a narrative that was developed. There was a platform for the narrative that was produced. The narrative spoke a language that a portion of the culture saw as an advantageous mechanism or means. 
the population of those accepting the narrative, in fact, spread the narrative until the narrative grew. The narrative has been built into the, now into the fabric of the culture. Now, anytime a narrative is spoken, there are going to be sides. Sides are going to be taken up concerning the narrative. And those who oppose the narrative, well, they're absolutely unequivocally wrong. Now, this is how the narrative has been developed. This is how the narrative in our world is being developed even as we speak. Where did such a divisive narrative come from? How did it happen? <laughs> well, I hate to say this, but they learned the way to do the narrative from the church. They learned it from those who said they were serving Jesus. Hard to understand, hard to believe, hard to fathom, hard to wrap your head around, but my friend, it's true. How to divide the people and choose sides was a work that the church has done extremely well. Not only concerning doctrine, but concerning who can go to church where and who can go to church with who. What a sad thing. We might as well own it. The most racially divided point in America is from 1030 to 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. How did that happen? Because we created a narrative. But the scripture describes something that is completely different. It describes a ministry that was provided from which, from which any and all of the boundaries that were placed up, the blockages, the limitations, could be brought down. As a matter of fact, the things that were seen as mountains, according to Zechariah, became plains when the Holy Spirit was involved and engaged. But what Jesus told us to do with respect to what he said was simply overshadowed by leaders who said they knew the way to do it, and they knew the way to do it even better than the way that Jesus did it. Because they came up with terms such as the Great Commission, of which was not mentioned. The concept, but... The idea of teaching and observing all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, we just dropped that off. What a sad thing. Well, people don't believe as they did. People don't believe as those that have created this intellectual boundary system were branded with words that were meant to embarrass them. Words that were often belittling. Words that were even barbaric concerning their worship. They were even in many cases referred to, and just within the last six months, a major radio preacher said that anybody that is operating in the gifts of the Spirit or speaking in tongues is doing a demonic activity. Major preacher. Well, what a tragedy. And we think... We've done God a favor. We think that we've come up with our own intellectual ideas and done God a favor. What we did, my friend, was we released a misguided, misunderstood, and misinterpreted doctrine. We have so bungled what a Christian is that we endorse anyone who mentions the name of Jesus as though because they mention and call Him their Lord and Savior... They have it all together. Only to find out that when we look behind the scenes and we inspect their lives, most often their lives do not reflect anything that resembles the instruction or the commands or the teachings of Jesus Christ. I remember years ago that there was an individual that I knew that purported himself to be a Christian. He used foul language all the time, but yet he would stand before anybody that would listen and tell them how he was a born-again Christian. Now the message comes out of his mouth and says, if you're a Christian, then this language is how you're going to show it. What a sad tragedy. But our world has so bungled the idea of what living for Christ is 
that we look up and we accept anything that even mentions the name of Jesus. I have seen the fellowship of Christian athletes have some of the absolute most pitiful speakers come because they could raise money. Put them in a Christian setting where everybody knew who they were and what they were, but let them stand and talk about Christ and everybody and then count the money. What a sad scenario, friends. What a sad scenario. Now why is this? Because we are convinced that those that simply say they're Christians identify that they believe there is a God and that Jesus died for the sinner. Well, that's good enough for me. Nah. Paul tells us, as I've described the three works on this side of heaven, that a Christian will be brought through as that Christian follows the actions of Jesus Christ. He'll have a change of mind. He'll die to the flesh. And from that change of mind, he will take on a new man. Hi there, buddy. How you doing, Karam? Good to see you. Now, he also tells us in Ephesians 2 that we will absolutely know them and identify them by the nature of their conversation. So how do we get here? We've been following the wrong directives of, in of an inaccurate narrative. It's simple as that. Will the narrative change because I bring it to light? No, it won't. Why? Because the narrative is too deeply embedded in the Christian community. There's too much money, buildings, land, power, and control on the line. Is that why? No. The narrative will not locate the truth for one reason. We are no longer thinkers. We are no longer seekers. We are no longer searchers. We are no longer seeking to discover the source of truth, the source of grace, the source of doctrines. We are no longer seeking to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We are following along as sheeple in the church, in the community, in the country, wherever we are. Why? Why? Because we have lost the concept of thinking on our own. We have lost the concept of critical thinking. Our children aren't being taught it. Those that were taught it have lost it because they have heard a narrative that has taken them down some path and instead of critically thinking about the narrative and the reason for the narrative, they say, oh, if that's what they say, then that must be right. We no longer can critically think and come to conclusions. We live in a world and a country right now where we are told what to think. We are told what our conclusion is going to be. Prove that, preacher. Well, my friend, it, it's not hard to prove. Look at the indoctrination going on right now in something such as our news media. We're told of such things as existential threats to democracy. We're told of dictators. We're told of rude behavior. We're told of racism. We're told of sexism. We're told uh, of all of these dastardly, almost monstrous things. And people eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner listening to that. And what happens? Their mind clicks in. It, it's all, it, 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 once it's fed the same thing over and over and over again, well, you're not going to change that. But the listener never researches. They never look into it. They never go to the root of the, of the subject. I used to have this conversation with a particular individual, and that individual said to me, where did you get your information? Well, I researched it. I listened and read in various researches, areas. 
I have the ability to go into at least 63 different newspapers, 63 different authors, 63 different articles, or, or 63 different businesses that are covering the news. So I go and look at the narrative for myself. I'm not listening to someone else's narrative. I'm thinking, following, studying, researching, and seeking for myself. Someone asked me one time, what commentary do you use when you preach? I don't. I don't use any commentaries. I read the Word of God. I research it. I seek it. I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I am a critical thinker. I put the puzzle together. We don't do that anymore in this world. We don't do it in church work. We don't do it in business work. And we don't do it in political work. We don't do it anymore. We're not critical thinkers. So what happens? There's no dive into the types of messages that are being offered at all. There's no look into exactly what the other side is doing. There's no understanding of this concept that what one side is saying, if we look into it, they're probably doing, and vice versa. There's, there's, there, there's no such ability to critically think, and then there's no such ability to define down to the nth degree what exactly the agenda is all about. How do I know that? Well, because I'm a preacher. Well, what's that got to do with it? Because I look into the church world, because the church world is the, the means and mechanism by which the natural world has picked up and refined everything they do. So when I study the Word of God and I see the doctrines of the intellect coming forward, i.e. the doctrine of the Great Commission, as an intellectual assault on the church world, but when I go into the scripture, I don't see it. When I see the intellectual assault that says there is no infilling of the Holy Spirit, but when I go into the scripture and I critically research it, I find it for myself. I see the, the world that says there is no Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and I critically research it and I find out, well, that ain't so. Why? I didn't need a commentary to tell me that. I didn't need someone who wrote a book to tell me that. No, no, I could see that in the book for myself. All I had to do was open it up and read. We're not critical thinkers anymore, friends. Therefore, we are losing the battle to win the lost. Because we cannot critically think ourselves into understanding the doctrines of truth. We cannot understand that we must come away from the cross, following Paul, as I said, read to you tonight, and go on and crucify our flesh, and go on and uh, deposit our sin nature, and then go on into the spiritual things with Jesus. We don't critically think. We think that if we say we know Jesus, that's all it's going to take. And my friend, I'm sad to tell you, that's not Bible. I heard a preacher say yesterday that if a man uh, served God, fell, and died before he could ask God for forgiveness, he was going to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. As a matter of fact, there is no support in the Scripture for it. As a matter of fact, the Bible said he won't tempt you above that you're able to bear. So he didn't tempt the individual more than he was able to bear. The individual simply saw what was drawing him away, and it became more important to him, and he took on a new master, not knowing the moment or the hour when he was going to be called to answer for himself. But in our intellect, we want everybody to go to heaven. That was one of the biggest preachers in this country. Now, what's the message that is heard out there? Well, it's a simple message. You just live any old way you want to. Because if you said you were saved, God's going to take you to heaven. My friend, the Bible does not support it. Read the scripture. It just isn't so. Read the word of God. 
So here we are now. We have these new narratives. And these narratives began in church narrative. And it's now surfaced in a national narrative. The issue is according to the narrative, the church or the evangelicals do not like this new narrative. The evangelicals are under attack due to their not accepting this new narrative. Huh. Wow. Isn't that something? This very same sort of attack came upon the Pentecostal church years ago. I remember my brother-in-law saying to me and preaching many times, we are not accepted uptown. We are often put on some back road while these big spacious churches are on the main street and full. But yet, we are put in the back and we are often, we're not accepted on Main Street, huh? Isn't that something? The world learned this method, my friend, from those who established these doctrines that eliminated the very thing that God established as His promise to the church. They determined they had a better narrative. Now the narrative has changed, and the outcome not only has been devastating to the cause of Christ, but it has now brought chaos into the entire culture. If only the church had just remained on mission. What mission, you say? It's simple. It's found in Luke, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. If only we had continued to do the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. But our intellectual way was far easier. Our intellectual way of, we see baptism in Jesus' name, so that must be right. We see Jesus, and if we see him as Jesus only, that must be right, regardless of what the rest of the word teaches. We see grace as the avenue that any man can come to Christ and not have to worry about it once you're saved, you're always in safe. That, that intellectual idea. Uh, or that idea of the Great Commission. My friends, these things have brought chaos to our culture. If only the church could have just remained on the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, from John the Baptist to Jesus... Think about this. And from the apostles who were primarily ministers to the Jews and on to Paul who introduced this ministry to the Gentiles. These preachers had a message. That message was blessed of God because they continued to do and to teach what Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, someone's going to say right here, but Paul's message and Jesus' message and message is different. They did. Because Jesus' message was to the Jews, and Paul's message was to the Gentiles. The Jews had to repent. The Gentiles had to believe. Yes, of course they were different. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. I didn't need a commentary to tell me that. <laughs> so, what does he require in order to successfully complete his work? What does the man of God require in order to successfully complete his work? Not because I said so, but because the Word of God teaches it so. He requires the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This concept seems to be the way that each and every ministry that made a lasting impact was prepared to handle, now watch this and I'm closing, was prepared to handle the demands of their audience. The demands of what their audience provided to them as opposition. Think about what I'm saying. What they had that made their mission successful was that they had the ability to be prepared to handle the demands. Jesus to the Jew, the apostles to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles, all had the ability to meet the demands of the audience 
in every step of their opposition. Why are we not winning the lost? Because we are not prepared to meet their opposition. We don't have a message for our audience. How, why not? We have a story, not a message. We have a story about what Jesus did for us, but we don't have a message. We, don't, we have a story of how he changed us, but we don't have a message. Why don't we have a message? Because we don't have the Holy Spirit ministering Jesus Christ's message into the heart, into the mind, into the flesh, and into the nature. We don't have the Holy Ghost doing what Paul defined that he did in Ephesians chapter 2 when he said, And you hath he quickened, you hath he made alive. Paul didn't do that. The Holy Spirit did that. So we are not equipped for the ministry. We would like to think we are. We have tried to teach ourselves to be. We've gone to the seminary, I mean the cemetery, the, the seminary, to try to get ourselves prepared. But we're no more prepared than uh, anybody who's out there trying to match intellectual wit to intellectual wit. No. Because the thing that set apart Jesus Christ, the apostles, and Paul's ministry was that they were all filled with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that ministry matched, met, and subsequently overmatched. Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Overmatched the opposition. Overmatched them. Not just matched them, but overmatched them. Because the Holy Spirit would speak and give us the things that we needed to say. He would show us a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a discernment of spirit, faith, healing, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. And they were overmatched. And Paul said, it would be through this that you would profit with all. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll open our eyes that we can see. Before it's too late, God, and our loved ones and our friends who are our audience, are left in a situation where there is no means to be saved. That you would bring to us the understanding of why it was essential for every major biblical ministry. That you would bring us the understanding of what it is that we need to do to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to bring the Holy Spirit's work into our life that allows you, Jesus, to speak through us and to us. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit has done a work in saving us. We know He's done a work. Every act of Jesus, the Holy Ghost has replicated. We know that. But it is, the, it is the act of the promise of the Father of which we lack. And because we lack that Father, we are unable to effectively and efficiently hear exactly what the audience needs to hear to combat their opposition. I pray that you will produce it in us and that we will submit to that production. In the lovely name of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, our Lord, and our man in the Godhead. Well, again, I'm not done, but I'm finished for tonight. There's always more to teach. I hope to be back with you probably Tuesday on Facebook and podcast. May God richly bless you is my prayer. I love you and I appreciate you. I want you to become critical thinkers and I want you to become critical listeners. I want you to get to the point where Jesus Christ can speak and show you great and mighty things that are to come. That's my prayer for you. I see so many wonderful people tonight. I see Ellen and Terry and Mary Hicks. I saw uh, uh, Jeannie and Charles and Sharon, and I'm sure there are more of you. And, and I wish I had longer to keep going, but I want to relegate this to about 30 minutes at a time. May God richly bless you all. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. God bless you until we have the chance to talk again. My friends on podcast, Jesus is Lord. 
Find him as Lord, and there you'll find him as the man who will mediate the covenant, be the greater. Find him, however, as the man in the Godhead, and there he, through the Holy Ghost, will show you great and mighty things that are to come. May God bless you.